If you want to learn how to start and run your own business, you've got two options. Spend years and thousands of pounds studying for a Masters of Business Administration, an MBA, or you can listen to our brand new Medics Money MBA feature where we break down interesting businesses either run by doctors or in the healthcare space and see what we can learn. So today I'm going to tell you about a 50 million pound a year business hiding in plain sight. Most of us have probably got this business in our pocket and don't even think that it could be a 50 million pound a year business. And I want to tell you about private practice 3.0. So private practice 1.0, oldest side hustle in the game for doctors. I'm talking about that on steroids boosted up to level three. And to do this, I am joined by Sané Goyal. Hi, Sané. Hey, Tommy. Pleasure to be on. Uh, so for those of you listening in and who, do, who don't know me, I'm one of the podcasters over on the What Medical School Doesn't Teach Us, which is primarily aimed for junior doctors and medical students. And I'm also a year before medical student, and I've just finished my intercalation in business management at Imperial College London. And I also also have some some experience, I'd like to say, in this uh, in this arena of just running a side hustle whilst being at medical school. So hopefully I can bring some of that experience when we break down these businesses. So I'm really excited. Are you going to do Um, like a pump, a pump and dump on your side hustle, getting it out there, or are you not going to talk about the name, the website, the URL, what are we talking? Uh, no, I'm not going to talk about it. I'll just, uh, I'll just keep it low key because keep the focus on the, keep the focus on the two businesses. Keep it low key. All right. Wow. Staying classy. (laughs) All right. I have no business training whatsoever. No formal training, uh, unlike Sané. But I do run two businesses and no doubt I learn a lot from hanging out with the experts of Medics Money. But I think maybe the best teaching is just wandering around and looking at businesses that you're exposed to every day and thinking about how the business model works. How do they get customers? How do they retain customers? How do they get me as a customer to buy more stuff from them? Like when I go into Starbucks, which is rare because I don't really like their coffee, uh, I just go in there for a flat white and then they try and upsell me with a a special offer of buying a flat white and a muffin for just £8.50 or something. Or or they're always trying to get me on a subscription. Why are they trying to get me on a subscription, which seems like insane value? Well, because subscription revenue is recurring revenue and maybe we'll talk about that. But all of this is hiding in plain sight for free if you know where to look. And one of my favorite places to look, and a massive hack that, this isn't a secret, I don't know why more people don't know about it, but in the UK, we have something called the Company's House website, where you can look up the financial information of any company in the UK. Like, you can literally see their financials. So if you're wandering around thinking, I wonder how much my local coffee shop makes, go on Company's House website and have a look. The data is there, publicly available for free, and I'm going to show you that today. Some companies you see a full profit and loss, some you just see a balance sheet. We'll talk about that, right? So let me tell you about the first business that I want to break down for you today, and that is the Blue Light Card. Okay, so you know about the Blue Light Card, Sonny? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one thing I just wanted to talk about was, um, just before we get onto the Blue Light Card, actually, is the Company's House. So obviously in one of these episodes, you know, we're going to get into some accounting, hopefully, and sort of, oh, we're actually doing some accounting, hopefully later in this episode as well. So you can actually go on companies out. And this is something that we did on our integrated degrees. You can get those accounts out and you can just do the maths yourself as practice. And this is you using real company figures and putting your skills into test. That way you're just an accountant without ever having to go to, and without ever having to pass accountancy exams. And it's the best where you can practice like this is what we did for our accountancy exams and it simply works so you'll be able to create like profit and loss sheets balance statements income statements all that sort of stuff just off companies out so i highly recommend you do go around and play on there like tommy said um yeah most useful skill yeah yeah and like just get started the first time you look at one of these uh, statements you're going to just be like wow head explosion time i'm going to break down like the real basics for you in a minute because i've got no training i have to keep it simple because if i don't keep it simple mm-hmm. i don't understand it i am you going to use some input that i've had from the boys at medics money who are very qualified just for a tiny bit but most of it this is all stuff that you could do yourself yeah so blue light card i love blue light card it saves a ton of money they've got an app And so I was thinking, how does a blue light card make money? And like, what's their business model? And how much do they make, right? So founded in 2008 by a policeman, and I believe one of his friends who was kind of doing IT work for schools and stuff. And their strap line is, we're here for you because you're here for us. Love that, right? 
Awesome. So Absolutely. basically, right, you're thinking, I haven't looked on Company's House yet, but they've got 2.5 million members. And those 2.5 million members pay, I think it's 4.99 for two years. So let's just say £2.49 a year. So you might think, okay, how much revenue, which is like the total amount of money they collect, how much revenue do they collect? Well, £2.49 times 2.5 million members get you to like £6.2 million pounds revenue. Okay. Not bad. Yeah, like pretty good. I like that. And also helping out a ton of NHS staff and emergency staff, etc. But their revenue is not 6.2 million pounds. Oh, no. And I remember when I looked on and saw this, I was just like, whoa. Okay, so um, let me share my screen. And I'm literally just going to walk you through it right now. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, you're going to see this. If you're not watching on YouTube, go check out our YouTube. Oh, yeah, um, Sonny. Actually, uh, I'm just looking at the numbers. And, you know, <laughs> as, as a medical student, I used to think, uh, I used to be quite naive. I think the first time I got it, before we started talking about it, Tommy, um, I used to think the blue light card is actually just something that's, this is so naive, but I thought it was provided by the NHS. You know, I thought the NHS was great. Um, and, you know, they really gave back to people who work at the NHS. And, you know, this is their way of, you know, helping all of us out with some discounts by partnering with some big companies and so on. And then and then I found these numbers and I've, I've learned about blue light cards. So <laughs> take us through yeah. the numbers, Tommy. <laughs> yeah. So, but to your point, right? Uh, the reason I love this business is because it's helping tons of our staff. Uh, this is not a sponsored episode, by the way, although Sane is head of sponsorships at Medics Money. So if you've ever heard one of our adverts and got really annoyed by it, blame Sane. But yeah, maybe we should get these. This is not a sponsored episode. But yeah, I love it because yeah, like they're helping out loads of NHS staff. <laughs> they're also making an insane amount of money. And that means this thing is sustainable. Like this business ain't getting blown up tomorrow. This is going to carry on providing benefits for NHS staff for a long time. So yeah, I've logged on Company's House. This is what you get if you just search Blue Light Card and you can literally just see everything. You can see that the original directors were changed in August, 2023. So we'll talk about that in a minute because uh, that's some super interesting information. But if you just go down and you can just go VPDF, you get to see their accounts, okay? And so then the accounts are like 30 odd pages, right? There's all these reports. And, and these reports just literally tell you how they make money, what risks they think, like what are their, what are their expansion plans? Uh, watch out Australia, because the blue light Australia card is coming. Who they've hired, who they fired, they give uh, like competitor risk. Like how, is there a chance of a competitor coming? Well, probably after this podcast, the <laughs> chance of a competitor is gonna be a bit higher. But yeah, uh, what is a competitor risk? So look at this, how much they save for members. Eventually, we scroll down and we see a range of numbers. Bear with me. I'm still scrolling. <laughs> Eventually, I'll get to the P&L. Not all companies, you see a full P&L. You just sometimes see a balance sheet. That might be changing because of something called the Economic Crime and Transparency Bill. But I think that was on its way through Parliament. And then Parliament is obviously shut down right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. But here we see a full balance sheet. So we estimated that their revenue would be 6.2 million based on selling 2.5 million cards a year. But actually... Their revenue is 57 million. Oh my God. Like gen, gen, genuinely, when I saw those numbers, I was, I was shocked. It just, it just, yeah, I mean, carry on going through the numbers. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we're going to talk about it. So. But this is my point, right? If you're just wandering around and you're thinking about things in a strategic business way, and this is no disrespect to anyone who's got an MBA because that's a very tough qualification, but you can teach yourself so much. Like you're just getting free, free information from these accounts of a highly successful business, right? But look, right, 57 million pounds of profit a year. But you know what they say? Profit is vanity. Well, yeah, hold up. Rewind. Revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity, right? And just to break that down, like the revenue is the total amount of money that they collect, okay? But if your business isn't very profitable, you could collect a hundred million pounds a year in revenue and only make a hundred thousand pounds. Okay. Because profit is sanity. So if you're not very profitable, your profit margin, that is how much profit you make versus your revenue is not going to be very good. But as we can see here, you don't need to worry about the uh, blue light card with uh, revenue is vanity and profit is sanity because they are very sane. Their gross profit, 44 million pounds a year. Like, Operating profit, 33 million, and net profit, 31 million. I mean, yeah, well, those are <laughs> insane numbers. That is, those are some incredible numbers. Incredibly, incredibly successful. And I mean, I mean, we're going to, we're going to get into the numbers shortly, but I guess it just shows you the beauty of like running, you know, what I would term in very simple terms, just like an online business. Like if you're selling a digital product of any kind, and in this case, they're essentially selling like 
discount codes online and people just pay for that subscription. It, it, it ties in that recurring revenue that we mentioned earlier. And that, you know, happens in places like Starbucks, really common one for me, people listening is actually Pret. So a lot of people buy the monthly Pret membership and you get like, I think it's like four free, four, four free or four coffees every month. Or I think it's like a coffee every 30 minutes. I don't know. It's one of the two, sorry, four every day every 30, like you can renew it after 30 minutes, something like that. Prayer, Netflix, so many of these recurring revenue ones. And then you've got literally this hiding in plain sight in your pocket every single day on your phone, the blue light card. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, and I guess like to your point, Sané, at a really basic level, the reason why these internet businesses and in inverted commas are so profitable is because essentially, apart from printing a card, right, which probably costs them like less than 1p to print, and they charge £2.49 for, they they have a very low COGS, what's, what's known as cost of goods sold, right, because they don't have to make, you know, if you're making uh, porcelain pots, right, you've got to make the porcelain pots, you've got to ship the materials around, you've got to make sure the porcelain pots don't get broken, you've got to deliver those porcelain pots. I am never going to start a porcelain pot business for the record, but I'm very interested in internet businesses because you don't have any of those problems associated with a physical product, you know, like I'm not going to open a green grocer because fruit and veg goes off and customers will be a nightmare and it's, it's got no leverage. Like, but internet businesses are different. Like the cost of the goods is essentially close to zero, right? Which is why their profit margins are so good. Absolutely. The cost of goods sold, which is what COG stands for, as you said, for, for a digital product is, is next to nothing. And it's something that you essentially you can create once and then it's, and then you just, and it just sells on repeat without any extra work, essentially. Like all you have to ensure at the start is that this product that you build digitally is of good quality, good standard. You know, you, it goes like the online products go through the same pipeline that a physical product would, it'd go through the same sort of, you know, piloting reviews, iterations, you know, changes to the, whatever is included in it. But then once it's ready to go and once it's getting great reviews, um, it's off to the races, honestly, which is what's happened here with the blue light card and, you know, any online product that you will ever sort of see that's doing great, will have gone through that same process. And then you'll realize there's this one point where it really picks up because everyone's talking about it. it's the craze now and they shoot off, which is what's happened here with a blue light card, because now all of us have it, so. Yeah, and I think like how I think about this is the mar what is the marginal cost of replication, right? <clears throat> and to break that down, what that means is, what is the cost of for blue light card of making one more blue light card or making one more customer? Well, the blue the, for blue light card and lots of online businesses, the marginal cost of replication is close to zero, right? Because once they've made the product, they made the software, they've made the website, they've set up the relationships with the discounters, right? That's all done. And if a million people join the website tomorrow as a result of listening to this podcast, it ain't going to cost them a million pounds to onboard those people. It's going to cost them almost nothing. Whereas I don't, I don't want to be hating on anyone who's making ceramic pots because I like ceramic pots. But if I get, if I'm a ceramic pot maker and I get a million orders, the marginal cost of me making those extra million orders is not zero. In fact, you could argue that it's, it's hardly any economies of scale at all. And the chance of me getting a million pots made in the next week, close to zero, right? I could never get that scale. But these guys can literally turn up their servers, throw me your three more pennies in the electricity meter, and they're good. So any business where the marginal cost of replication is zero is an insane business. And it, like, like to your point, Sunny, like the biggest business in the world, like for Google, if they get an extra customer, they don't have any significant costs. You know, uh, a lot of these software as a service companies, which are all through medicine right now on a smaller scale. Um, it, I know you've got some examples, but they have a, a marginal cost of replication that's close to zero and that can make a lot of profit. We're looking at some jargon here, like if you're watching on YouTube, gross profit, operating profit, et cetera, et cetera. I thought it might be useful to just define those terms so that we can actually claim that we've taught people something today. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So what might be... Good is if we just recap at, from the start. So obviously, if you're working at this on YouTube, then you can see 2022 and 2023. So you can see that the 2022 statement is to the right. Um, and essentially, like that's the way that companies house and companies submit. And it's essentially their balance from the remaining year, from the previous year, previous financial year, to be exact. So actually, at the end of the last year, you can see that they made 20.9 million pounds in profit for that financial year. And then obviously for the 2023 column, that's the most recent financial year because accounts aren't due 
for 2024 until until January. So that they aren't on there yet. So I guess uh, firstly looking at revenue. So revenue is a total amount of money a company would make in any given financial year. And that includes money from almost any sources except interest. Interest is added on later. Then that's followed by gross profit. So your gross profit is essentially just your revenue minus your cost of sales. So that is the money you've made without taking away any other expenses, such as you know, admin costs, um, building costs, staff, um, and any other natural costs you can expect to be associated with a business. Um, and those costs aren't actually linked to the product costs, which would come under the cost of sales. So you have to make, there's a very clear distinction between those two different types of costs. Your gross profit is essentially, you can then calculate your gross profit margin based off that. Um, and your gross profit margin is a percentage of revenue that your business retains after you've deducted direct expenses minus costs associated directly with making and selling your products or services known as the cost of goods sold. It includes the cost of raw materials, equipment, manufacturing supplies, wages for people required for directly making a product and transporting goods. So as mentioned earlier, anything product related goes into cost of sales. You subtract that from revenue, you get your gross profit. This is then followed by subtracting your admin expenses and any other overheads that you might have, for example, you know, marketing or any other sorts of things, any other sort of fixed costs, essentially, which gives you, you know, your non-recurring administrative uh, and also adding on any non-recurring administrative expenses as well. Then once you've subtracted all of that, leaves you with your operating profit. So in this case, in the 2023 year, the blue, the blue light card had 33 million pounds of operating profit, which is incredible. Um, I'll quickly quickly mention what the operating profit margin is and then maybe Tommy can tell you why. It's, it's incredible. So, so the operating profit margin, essentially similar to the gross profit is essentially the percentage of income remaining after you've deducted the operational costs for the day-to-day -day running of your business, variable costs, including rent, insurance, accountancy fees, marketing, entertainment, offices, all that shebang. And your operating profit margin is your earnings before interest and tax. So that happens later. So this is, so your operating profit can also be called EBIT, earning before interest and tax. So you shouldn't include, include tax and debt interest payments when calculating your operating costs. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. You're like 33 million pounds, Tommy. What do you, what do you think about that? I think that it's insane, right? The profit margin, but then I was thinking, well, how insane is it? So I went over to the office of national statistics website to look at the average company, right? So in 2019, the average profit margin, and I'm assuming they're talking about net profit, right? Cause you gotta be clear what you're talking about. But I generally tend to be like, if you want to know, like how much do they actually make after they've you know, spent all their money on staff, spent all their money on materials, uh, spent all their money on tax. Net profit margin is a pretty good measure. But I think the, the net profit margin in the UK, if our average business is 9.3%, 9.4% for manufacturing companies. And interestingly, for service firms like, you know, accountants or marketing agencies or things like that, uh, it's, it's a bit higher at 15, 14.9. So that kind of tells you where that kind of average is. It also says that like profit margins for restaurants, right, are between three and 6%. Like that is just a nightmare business for me to run as well. It's just got like, oh yeah, I'm never opening a restaurant or a pottery shop. But yeah, so that's kind of like puts their margins in perspective. And I think we've kind of gone through a bit about why their margins might be insane because they, they, they've got a good reputation. So probably their marketing spend isn't that high because the word of mouth power is incredibly strong. They are a digital online business. So they don't, you know, marginal cost of replication of making an extra card and adding an extra customer is almost zero. In fact, you could argue that they start to benefit from like a superpower, which is like what's called network effects, which is basically mm. like network effects are really powerful in like social media. Like imagine you started your social, your own social media network and there was five people there. It's not enough, but so suddenly as soon as you get like a thousand or 10,000 people there, it starts to sort of perpetuate itself. And I think this business probably does have network effects because more people tell it about it. They get more better deals. They get more businesses interested as well. I did have a little delve into like how they essentially make their money and how like these discount, I mean, it's a discount card thing, basically, right? There's 
loads of them and i like this one because it's in it's in a niche right and their niche is any emergency services which is like a massive niche so i guess that's another thing like their tam their total addressable market loads of jargon going in today but hopefully we're de-jargoning it for you so their tam which is basically how many possible customers do they have it's pretty big like although they've picked a niche which is emergency services they've picked a massive niche and as I told you earlier, they're going into Australia. So that's just like another whole marketplace. So I actually think this could be a, a business valued at a billion pounds, like within the next five years, like not advice, do your own research. And I also think we know tons of people, Sane, who are doing amazing things, trying to use AI and technology to improve patient care and everything like that, right? I guarantee you, none of the people that we know, balance sheet looks like this. Some some police officer and a so sort of someone with some IT skills has span up, you know, a business doing 31 million pound a year profit, um, which is kind of funny, I guess, because they're not, yeah. they're not using AI. They're not doing it. There's, there's no AI in their pitch deck. I guarantee it. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think, I think it really highlights what a business needs to be. It's something I believe truly, like I've never been one for like fancy fancy like sorry fancy like schmucks and like trying to like you know stay up with the times and like trying to put ai into like literally every single thing that i do um like a lot of my workflows still aren't like ai optimized just because doing them normally as as a human actually just works better it gives you better results you know there's nothing like crazy going on in this business and a lot of businesses and i and i firmly believe that actually taking like an existing business model and just doing it that much better, um, differentiating yourself maybe in terms of the niche, in terms of customer service, in terms of maybe price as well, and depending on what you're offering, like those three things can take you a very, very long way. You don't need to come up, you don't need to be the next sort of, I don't know, the next Steve Jobs or, you know, the next uh, Bill Gates and find this crazy idea for a business. You just need to take something that's already existing, do something better and off we go. Like. So aside from this, like a really good example that one we covered on our course and we talked about was actually Gymshark. So Gymshark literally sells gym wear, nothing, nothing fancy about that. But the way when they started off, one of the ways they differentiated from the other gym wear selling brands was literally because they Gymshark just offered more sizes and they accommodated for like the plus size people and so the petite people. And they were able to differentiate really well on that. And that's why they took off. And that's why they were like, you know, one of the world's biggest gym wear selling brands now. Similarly with, you know, these guys, they've just picked a niche that really needed something, I think. And particularly like, I, I feel like they particularly took off like during the pandemic or so sort of just after the pandemic. And I think they were, and I think it was a time when I think everyone in the emergency sector really wanted to, you know, feel, really wanted to feel valued. And this was a way for people to feel valued um, because this because people could sign up to the blue light card essentially save money in tons of aspects of their life you know for example if you're booking bus tickets on the national express or you're booking train line tickets you're taking your family out for a meal you're ordering a gift for your parents or, or your kids anything at all you're able to use the blue light card and it's became such an integral part for people which is i think what drove really drove the blue light card as compared to sort of any other discount cards that you might see at all. And I think I would like to think that the blue light card is doing just as good as like potentially any other loyalty card scheme that, that that's out there. Um, even though, you know, you wouldn't say this is a loyalty card scheme. It is like a funnel to a loyalty card scheme almost. Cause like, you know, a lot of these other companies will then go on to have their own loyalty cards, but I would say it's competing with a lot of those schemes out there in terms of revenue, in terms of growth, in terms of profitability primarily and keeping those customers coming back in. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely right. You mentioned Gymshark as well. There's something kind of cool about Gymshark, which is essentially how they managed to grow so fast. Cause on paper, Gymshark looks like a nightmare to me because you're selling physical products like t-shirts. They have a neg yeah. negative cash cycle. Negative cash cycle. Come on. Yeah. Like we're going deep in the weeds here, but I think this is really important concept because you're like, how did and the reason I chose Blue Light Card, by the way, is because this was literally started by two normal people like me and you. And in the last 15 years, they have gone from like, if you go back back in time, like their first set of accounts, horrible, disgusting. But now in 15 years, they've grown this slowly, organically, and I love it. And Gymshark 
it, I'm not going to say a billion pound business is relatable, but I can see how they did this. And when I found out about negative cash flow, I was like, oh my days, that is genius. Tell us about it. So very simply put, the way a negative cash cycle cash flow works and how Gymshark did it to do it really well was let's wait, let's get this clear. So blue light, the blue light card is a digital product. Let's class it as a digital product. Let's just say they don't have any costs associated in terms of manufacturing, which is where Gymshark is, is very different, right? So Gymshark has, is going to have, so let's take the example here. So the blue light card has a cost of sales of 13.2 million. Gymshark is going to be way higher simply because they're going to have to pay for manufacturing of those clothes. They're going to have to pay for the transport. You know, they probably have to like cover customs, you know, they have to source the raw materials that they use in their clothes, all these different things, packaging, and you know, there's so much, so much going on to create that single product that then needs to be shipped out. Their cost of sales is going to be really, really high. And the way a lot of manufacturing businesses work is they actually work. Well, we're going to be introducing tons of other concepts like here, like, like budgeting and things like that. But essentially what Gymshark did was they asked their producers, their manufacturers, to give them a pretty long runway on when they had to pay back their dues. So if Gymshark essentially took like, say, you know, for the ease of numbers, 10 million in terms of credit from their manufacturers, and then said, Hey, give us like a hundred days to pay that back. However, when those products were manufactured and then sold to customers, the customers paid Gymshark back sooner than the hundred days. So say if the customer is paying back in 20 days and then Gymshark essentially has another 80 days before they need to return that money. So Gymshark is already able to make profit on all of the clothes sold in that 20 days and then still have 80 days left over before they need to pay back their manufacturers. So now because they have all that profit already sitting in their bank, they can use that profit to fuel their growth before even having to worry about paying their manufacturers back. So, you know, that, what that growth might look like, it might look like opening a new store. It might look like a social media drive on, you know, for marketing. It might look like introducing a brand new clothing line, improving the branding, maybe expanding to a new country, not just opening a new store, tons of different ways to grow. So that might take them say another 40 days. So now we're on 20 plus 40, we're on 60 days and they still have another 40 days to pay their manufacturers back for whatever amount. This essentially creates this negative cash flow cycle, which essentially means that Gymshark never has to spend their own money to grow. They're just spending other people's money. That sounds really bad when you listen to it on the podcast, but that's the truth. Like that's how they grew so fast, rapidly. And it's, it was, it was, I think when they did it, it was near unheard of in their industry. I think usually in the manufacturing industry, particularly like in clothes, negative cash cycles are really rare. It's really, really hard simply to do through the nature of the business. But I think, you know, what comes into this, apart from like budgeting and other accountancy concepts is actually people skills. I think relationships with your manufacturers, relationships with your distributors, relationships with your like team members and, you know, literally everywhere along the supply chain are so important to make that work. And I think Gymshark does a great job of it. Uh, so that's, that's negative cash cycles in a nutshell. Might have got a bit confusing, but I'm sure I'm sure we'll be recapping it multiple times over. No, I think it's worth taking a tangent on that. This is going to be a really tangent -y episode because we both got so much to say about this. But exactly what you just said, like basically they they before they've even had to pay their suppliers, they've sold the goods. So again, another cliche: cash flow is king. Right? You'd hear that all the time. Until I ran businesses, I didn't even understand the significance of that. But for Gymshark, their cash flow is insane. It's like negative because they're. Well, it's not negative, but they've sold that they've sold the goods and collected that profit before they even had to pay the supplier, which is just an insane business model. And then the effects of that are rapid growth, you know, lots of good cash flow. Probably didn't take much private equity funding, so then you retain a large part of the business yourself, which is like who wouldn't want to do that? So yeah, I love that Jim Shark example. I'm gonna wrap up with Blue Light Card, right? So we've hammered their profit and loss. We love it. Nice one, Steve, and I forget the other founder's name. But you remember the start? I said company's house is gold mine, right? So I'm just like scrolling this, right? I've seen the I've seen the accounts, loved it, right? But I'm looking at here. It says termination of appointment of Steve Denny and Thomas Dalby, and I'm like, oh, what's happened there, right? Because they are the original two founders that have been terminated. Sounds bad, doesn't it? But actually, and this is where I needed a bit of help from the experts of Monix Money. And this is just, you know, publicly available data. I'm not doing anything funny. But basically what happened was a parent company came along 
And that parent company spent £308 million around August 2023 on something. And it so also happens that their directors were terminated there. So it looks like basically the original founders sold out. It looks like they got £308 million. Okay, like don't, don't tie me to these numbers. This is just reverse engineering things. So they sold out for £308 million, right? And that's why I said at the start that I think this is a legit billion pound business in plain sight because if they can keep their growth going which maybe they can maybe they can't but if they can branch out into australia and new markets and they're successful to that right if they were worth 308 billion pounds on a 31 million pound net profit margin in 2023 if you like double that triple that you're gonna way increase the value so the company that brought them as well probably is going to do what we call vertical integration, which is another bit of jargon. I'm sorry, but basically the, the company that brought them owns Virgin Experience Days, which essentially sells like red less a day kind of business where you like go drive a race car for the day or whatever. So maybe that company is hoping to sell some red letter days to blue light card people because i know that the blue light card people do like a day at a theme park where they kind of like yeah. rent out the whole theme park so maybe they're going to expand that and maybe that by going vertically integrated i.e selling a instead of selling other people's products like here's 10 pounds off in starbucks they're going to sell their own products they're going vertically integrated and that could really boost their profits as well i mean that is just kind of a hypothetical based on reverse engineering some stuff. I don't know what you think about that, mate. Yeah, I mean, 308 million, that's, that's not bad. Yeah, and I, I mean, that just shows like how successful the business is as a model. Also the fact that they probably didn't have to take, if any, you know, private equity or other sources of funding because they were able to get such a such a handsome payout at the end of at end of their 15 years. Um, what was really interesting for me, what, I was, what I've been thinking about is actually the growth. So obviously vertically, vertically integrating is great. You know, they're expanding to Australia which is also fantastic. But then I was thinking, how replicable is the blue light card for other industries? So you, know, you could go to finance, you know, I'm sure all of those guys would also like, obviously they earn a lot more than doctors and other emergency services do on average, but I'm sure they would love a discount or whatever they do. And you could have like a higher end blue, tier, blue light card. You could go into like education sector. You could go, it's, it's, it's such a replicable business model. Like, it could work in literally every sector or nearly every sector. And the beauty of it is it's basically a household name. Like every other guy or every other store you go into, you will come across someone who's like, oh, do you do blue light discount or do you do NHS discount or, or, or any other sort of emergency services? And people know what the blue light card is. Like, even if you're not a doctor and you ask them, oh, have you heard of the blue light card? I'm sure someone will be like, oh yeah, I, I, I might have heard of it. It's such... A household name now like it's so easy for them to enter literally almost any sector and see immediate traction even if they didn't go to australia and they decided to stay in the U uk they could just replicate this well other sectors easy and this is that net network effect coming in again it's it's just going to keep growing there's there is no other way and obviously if you're if you're talking about this vertically integrating into days and you know other sort of things then i mean the possibilities are endless yeah, I agree. And like, they know how to operate a business like this. They've got the software in place. They've got the staff in place and they could just literally port this business model into another niche. Like you said, my only counter to that would be, I think if I'm a company and blue light Large card come along to me and say, look, can you give me a 20% discount for my members? You, uh, I'll take 10%, right? Cause that blue light card, take 10%. We, we'll take 10%. Everyone's happy, right? I'd be like, oh, yeah, it's for emergency staff. Happy days. If you came to me and said it's for accountants with <laughs> no offense intended mm -hmm. to our colleagues at Medics Money, that's a bad example. Let's just say lawyers, right? Oh, no, because then, oh, we work with some lawyers as well. I'm going to offend someone here, but I don't think there's that fuzzy, warm feeling about offering a lawyer, sorry, lawyers, 20% discount. I'm just saying. Yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. That sort of corporate goodwill doesn't exist there. Yeah. In the paperwork as well, they say like risks to the business and like the chance of a competitor is low because they're so massive. They're so dominant. They're basically the dominant player in the marketplace. I'm going to throw out a little risk for them, which is they do cover like they want to cover as many people as possible. So they cover NHS stuff. They cover police. They cover if you drive a four by four emergency response car to tow other four by fours. I mean, maybe they've gone a bit broad. Maybe, maybe someone would come back over the top and go super niche and just do it for NHS. Like when's the medics money NHS staff discount card launching is basically what I'm saying just for NHS staff. Yeah. 
No, no one else. I, I think you could go reverse niche on them and like out niche them, maybe, but it would be hard. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you create something for the NHS only, I mean, the NHS is like you know one of the world's largest employers. So many people in there, you know, all the way from doctors like to nurses, allied help. Like, there's so many people that could just sign up to a card, and that's if you can create something for that niche in itself. It's, it's yeah. Like you, you, you're off to the races as well. It's just, I guess it's, it's just a case of, you know, either you create something on the like card potentially, which is recurring revenue and it's very lucrative for both the company and the individual, or, or you create something else, which essentially follows along the same principles, but maybe isn't the blue like card, but you're right. I think someone could do that. I think, I think it'd just be so hard to differentiate. I just think it'd be so hard for someone to differentiate from the blue light card, if we're if we're sticking to the same sort of marketplace, unless unless you're offering better discounts, I really don't see why someone would switch from the blue light card to an alternative. Now, if you came along and said to me, you know, if you work for the NHS and you actually get this card for free, which is what I believe happened with the blue light card at the start, so I believe the card was actually given for free as part of your job for like a couple of years before then then they pay, started paying out unless i'm mistaken that's that's the only way you can get people to sign up for free and then have them go off but otherwise i don't i don't see any reason for anyone to switch it's it's no hassles no brainer yeah and i think that's a good point if you're going to launch a competitor in the same kind of market space you like the first thing i'd ask myself is how am i going to do it better and i think you've suggested a few ways like better discounts etc cetera, etc cetera. but to your point I think <laughs> I agree with their blue light card. It would be incredibly hard. You know, I think in the accounts, it says they saved their users of the blue light card 350 million pounds last year. So that's, wow. you know, and that's probably where the revenue comes, isn't it? Like 10% of that, that's 35 million. Add in the six or seven million they get from selling the, the actual piece of card and you get to sort of near those numbers. So it's a pretty simple, it's a very simple business, but it's just been executed well. All right. This has gone on way longer than I anticipated, but we have no idea if you're going to find this useful. So if you're listening on the podcast, don't worry. We get the anonymized user data, which tells us that after five minutes of me and Sane talking about this, everyone tuned out and they just wanted to hear about the usual medics money stuff. But if you're watching on YouTube, hit the thumbs up button and leave us a fire emoji right in the comments if you want to hear part two. Because we're going to record part two right now, but we ain't releasing it if people don't want to hear it. Because me and Sane talk about this stuff all the time amongst ourselves, and that's literally what we're doing now. But in part two, I'm going to tell you about the oldest side hustle for doctors, I talk, and that's private practice, right? And I talk about the problems for it, and I'm going to show you a real-life example of someone who is solving those problems. Uh, so if you want to see that, we need to see fire emojis on YouTube. We need to see the thumbs up. We need to see comments. And... If you want to start a comment war in YouTube, the algorithm absolutely loves that. So please disagree with us. So the algorithm will just blow it up. And we may see you on part two of the Medics, Medics Money MBA if people like it. And if they don't, we'll just keep talking about it amongst ourselves. And I'm kind of regretting talking about this one in public because I'm just thinking the Medics Money discount card, maybe we could do ethical businesses only and we could do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Okay, let's go.